So this is uh, by request. Someone was asking about um, various vector algebra and calculus identities, in particular the vector triple product. Um, and there's a famous identity for that, a cross b cross c. Um, and I started thinking about that, and there's just a lot of lot of great things to say. It's really um, the intersection of a bunch of of great stuff. So. This is going to be at least three ways, uh, spread over various, I'm not sure how many videos, of looking at the vector triple product. Um, and as usual, the point is not so much necessarily just to explain this, but to look at some ways of thinking uh, that are exemplified by this great, um, uh, the identities we can get here. So the first way is pretty low tech. Um, it doesn't need uh, anything fancy like differential forms like the the, the second way is going to require. but I, it is going to be more than just grinding out a calculation. Um, you could just, of course, grind it out with coordinate formulas, but that's never interesting. Um, and so what we're going to try and do is try to get a somewhat advanced perspective, even though the technology won't be that, that high. Um, I would call it geometric guess and check, basically. So we're actually going to be able to guess the formula, not just prove, that, prove it given that we know it from a book. So first of all, um, the triple product, a cross b cross c, it's tri-linear, okay? So as usual with a lot of these videos, what I've pre presented here is um, something that you should actually try to do on your own if you can. It'll be a challenging investigation, but um, please pause the video whenever um, there's a new par problem or a new part and try it on your own, okay? So um, tri-linear is like linear or bilinear. It means it respects sum and scalar products. Scalar, uh, scalar multiplication. And so here's one thing we'd want to show. That if I took the sum of two vectors and put it into one of the three slots of this gadget, we're really thinking of it as one single thing that gives you um, one answer. Three inputs, A and B and C, in that order, boom, it pops out a vector. And it's true, it's just taking the, the cross product twice. But we're thinking of it as its own gadget for right now. Okay. Um, and so we'd want to show that uh, it's that it respects sums in each of its slots, and that it respects scalar multiples in each of the slots. OK, so first of all, for, for 1a, um, this is really, it's pretty easy. <laughs> okay, This is just um, the distributive law, which is part, a little more fancily, called part of bilinearity for the cross product. Okay, I'm just I'm not doing anything with b cross c. I'm just leaving it alone. So it's just distributive law for the cross product. Okay, um, for um, let's see for b the analog b for b b if you know what I mean. Okay, what we'd want is let's see let's take this. Okay, we want well, let's display it. Okay, we'd like to be able to put in a sum here and get out um, a sum of, of the corresponding triple products just with b and just with b prime. Well, that's just, just distributive law twice. That's going to be, uh, whoops, control v. OK. First of all, I can take this guy, the b plus b prime cross c, and then use the distributive law inside. And that's just going to be a b prime. But then that's just going to be using the distributive law for the cross product again, a cross b cross c plus a cross b prime cross c, which is exactly what we'd like. We'd like the same the same gadget with just b in it or just b prime in it in that slot. Add it up gives you the, that thing with b and b prime added up. Okay, It's very similar for c. So uh, what about this one? If you scale one of the vectors, any one of the vectors, it just scales the final answer. That's a very nice property. Again, this is pretty obvious from the similar product uh, property of just the cross product, that a scalar comes out. Just like in this case, if you put a k in here, you just have to use it twice. The k would pop to here, and then the k would pop all the way up. Okay, so I'll just say easy follows from the corresponding fact for the cross product. Okay. So why is this so nice to know? Why do I start out with it and say it's the most important thing? Well, suppose that we could calculate a cross b cross c with just some very limited special cases, just ijk, 
the standard basis vectors. Okay, so it could be i cross j cross k, i cross i cross i, j cross i cross j, all the possibilities. Okay, suppose we knew all those answers. Why would that be very helpful for understanding the triple product in general? Think about that. Pause the video if you want. Okay. All right. So whenever I have something that's multilinear in this case, then for example, suppose I wanted to do a general. Suppose I wanted to calculate a cross b cross c. I'm going to copy that in, but I'm going to replace a with uh, a1 i plus a2 j plus a3 k. Let's bold those guys. So just writing it out in components. And then I think I'll just use that and copy it in here. And that's just going to be B. Oh, and I'm going to need that in parentheses. So that's going to be B written out explicitly. Oh, I didn't want that, did I? Don't know why I got a 9 there. Oh, I see. I just didn't hit the control enough, as usual. And then C, the same thing with C. Well, if I write it out this way, what I can do is I can just use those distributivity laws, in other words, use the trilinearity, to pop it out um, as just various coefficients, like a1, b1, c1 times i cross i cross i, or a2, b1, c3 times j cross i cross k. Okay, So that's going to be just a big sum. So in other words, knowing just the basis uh, examples gives me the general. And that's, that's the incredibly multi important fact about multilinearity. It says that if you understand just what happens for the basis vectors, you understand the thing completely in principle. Okay. So in particular, take a look at D here. Suppose someone gives us a very different looking formula, or we come up with a very different looking formula, some sort of proposed identity that A cross we claim A cross B cross C is always equal to something that looks very different. But suppose it gives the same answer as the triple product, what we want to calculate, just for these answers. Okay, That's a finite calculation, because at most, there's 27 possibilities. Three, three possibilities for A, three for B, three for C. Okay, um, If there's the same on all of those, then this principle up here says they must be the same in general. So that's, that's very powerful already. It says that, OK, if you at least give me a formula, I can at least just check it on some very, very simple cases. And we know that that's going to be simple to check. I cross J, J cross K, those aren't very hard. We know what those are. Um, and so that's going to be something we're going to use later. Okay. So that's what trilinearity buys us, is that the, well, part of what it buys us, is the ability to just check it on a very small, finite number of cases. Okay, let's look at some other properties. Other pretty easy ones, I think. How are A cross B cross C and A cross C cross B related? Think about it for a sec. Of course, uh, they are negatives of each other. Okay, just because of the negativity, the um, anti-symmetry of that cross product inside, and then the minus sign just just fly, flies out. Okay, what does that tell you? It tells you if you understand I cross say J cross I, you understand I cross I cross J. Um, so that already, in terms of this kind of strategy in in D, that already reduces the workload. Okay. We can also reduce the workload even further by looking at number three. It's going to be particularly simple in some cases. So this is this is a really good place to pause because it's not some some of this is not super easy, but um, but very good for your geometric intuition on cross products. Uh, the first one is not too bad. If B is parallel to C, so if it was like I cross J cross J, then what should we get? We of course should get zero because that's just using that internal cross product again. If they're parallel vectors, the cross product of two parallel vectors should be zero. That again reduces the workload if we're looking at the strategy in 1D. We're never going to have to try I cross J cross J or K cross I cross I. It's, it's just silly. Okay, We just know it should be zero. Although, it, it, we shouldn't just ignore it from now on. What it does say is that it, if we start looking at a formula that sort of doesn't obviously have that property, um, it really shouldn't, it's not going to be, a, it's going to be a non-starter for the formula. Okay. So we're going to use that um, as well. These conditions that we're going to get, the trilinearity, the fact that it should be anti-symmetric, 
in um, B and C. The fact that it should be zero if B and C are parallel. These are all ways to lead us to a formula and to check if our formula looks correct. Okay, so B this is a little trickier. If B and C are both orthogonal to A, not just one, but if they're both orthogonal to A, what is A cross the quantity B cross C? Think about the geometry of the cross product and how that works. Well, B cross C is itself orthogonal to B, B, both B and C. So B and C, if they're not co collinear, so let's assume that they're not collinear, okay? Because if they're collinear, then it's just zero. If they're not collinear, um, then they span a plane, and there's a normal vector to that, and uh, the cross product is a normal vector to that plane. But what if A is also normal to that plane? That's what this says. Then A is going to be parallel to B cross C, now using again the fact that the cross product of parallel vectors is zero, we get zero. Okay, so particularly simple, I was trying to be a little coy there. It's zero in these cases. Okay, so what about, um, more about A cross B cross C. When it's not zero, what is it? Where is it? Okay, the claim is it lies in two interesting planes. One is the plane normal to the vector, and we're supposed to fill in the blank here, and the other one, the plane containing or spanned by these two vectors. This is a nice little thing about planes, nice little review of planes. Two ways to describe a plane. The implicit way is it's all vectors normal to some vector, let's say n. Okay, That's a very common way of describing planes. But there's another equally useful, but sort of complementary way, the, um, the parametric or explicit or constructive way to define a plane. It's the plane that's all linear combinations of two vectors. Or in other words, the plane containing or spanned by two vectors. Okay. So, all right, so first of all, what vector is A cross B cross C obviously normal to? It's obviously going to be normal to the vector A by the properties of the cross product. But in a kind of an elaboration of what was going on in number three, it's also going to be normal to the normal vector of the plane B cross C. Well, if it's normal to the normal vector of the plane spanned by B and C, then it's going to be back in that plane. Okay, so that's going to be nice to know. And I'm realizing I probably should have had a... Whoa, uh, there we go. Probably should have had some pictures drawn, but um, for the next... I'll. For the next video, I'll go ahead and draw those pictures that are kind of make, making this clear. Okay. Um, in fact, that's a good place to stop. It's probably getting long enough to stop right now. So I'll come back with another video where we draw a few pictures of this and then continue with this version of how to understand the vector triple product.